this is this this is the this is something again. Lazy people are are doing wrong. If you really want to do well long term, this is what you do. F- again, five products. Don't get don't go product crazy. Test a bunch of audiences. When you're getting your first initial sales on those products, pick up the phone and call these people. It's usually you know some lady named Karen from Missouri who ordered your spatula product. Call her. Say hey, my name's you know my name's Colin McGuire. I own XYZ company. I saw your order come through. First of all, I wanted to thank you for your order. Second of all, I'm currently out of stock on that product, but um, a lot of and, and I, I just sold out. I just ordered more for my manufacturer, um, so it's gonna it, it might it might be a little while. Um, a lot of people have been finding me on Facebook recently, and that product sold out really quick. They're going to say this. Oh, yeah, I found you on Facebook, too. Yeah, no shit, because that's the only way only way I'm getting traffic to this website and this product. And you say, I am I may have my manufacturer ship the product to you directly. I will let you know soon. And now she had connected with the business owner from something she purchased online. They called her. They thanked her for their order. She now has the expectation set that this thing is not coming very quickly. You have two to four weeks now to get that product from China in white packaging to her doorstep. Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Uh, I'm not actually sure what episode this is. I think we're almost into the 30s now, but uh, this has been uh, one of my favorite parts about... uh, about running iStack training is, is doing these podcasts and having super vital, really interesting conversations with amazing entrepreneurs, uh, doing, doing incredible things. Uh, Colin is someone that I've been co- in contact with for a little while now, um, bouncing some ideas back and forth with. And he approached me asking if, if, uh, you know, if, if, if I had a slot available and he told me some of the things he wanted to talk about. And it was exactly what, uh, I'm super keen on talking about right now about the e-commerce space and about how to ascend uh, yourself and ascend your business to, to ways where you can make things more long term, more sustainable. Uh, and, and Colin, I think, is one of the perfect people to talk to about that. So Colin McGuire is the CEO of Boomin, which is an ROI focused digital marketing agency that specializes in customer acquisition. Uh, his team develops and executes strategies uh, for large consumer brands, TV personalities and artists. Uh, he's been featured in Inc. and Forbes. Uh, he's been, uh, launching, helping brands launch, uh, since 2010. He's calling from Chicago. Welcome to the robust marketer today, Colin. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Thank, thanks for having me. I've, yeah. uh, I, I've been a, a listener of the podcast for a while and seen a, a lot of different people that I respect, uh, join and share value. So I hope that, um, kind of my, my journey in the digital marketing slash e-commerce world uh, I'm hoping I can share a ton of value with, with, uh, those that, that, that listen to the podcast as well. Nice. So Based for- on, yeah, no problem. And based on the notes that you've sent over, it's exactly what we want to be talking about today. So let's get to it. Let's, we'll get to it in a sec. First, tell me a little bit about your marketers hero's journey. How have you sort of got to where you are today? Yeah. So, um, I basically started in, in digital marketing and e-commerce on, on accident, um, I, the, the very first thing that happened was in, in college, I ended up, uh, starting to tell, sell t-shirts online. Um, and they were more of like funny, vulgar t-shirts. Um, and we're talking like, you know, pre, pre 2012, around 2010, 2011, um, decided I, I went on at the time it was called elance.com. Of course, now Upwork, a lot of, yep. a lot of digital marketers you use it as a, a big time resource. Um, I went on Upwork, had no idea what, or I went on Elance, had no idea what I was doing. Uh, hired someone overseas to build me a WordPress with WooCommerce site, um, and had friends that were in college kind of design some stuff for me, uh, that I thought were funny and, and would end up on t-shirts. So that was, it, it was kind of an accident for me. Uh, I, I got started by starting my first, uh, e-commerce brand in college. I uh, started running a lot of, uh, Facebook ads. I was, Back in the day when uh, the rules were not as they are now, you could pretty much like poach other p- pages, uh, fans and such, uh, the interest targeting and and just a lot of the uh, targeting options available then um, were, were totally different as well as the saturation levels were much lower. Uh, there was, 
you know, a fraction of the amount of advertisers on the platform then. Um, and people really weren't all of all, um, you know, now we kind of have like a, you know, like a sixth sense. You can scroll through your newsfeed and you can, you, you can tell which one's an ad. A lot of consumers on social media can tell what is an ad and what's not an ad now uh, without even looking at it. It's almost like you, you can sense the, the format. We've gotten used to the formats. Um, and so back then there wasn't really, it was just image link, you know what I mean? And, uh, and so th that, that's how I, I got my teeth cut. So I ended up growing that e-commerce brand, selling it, um, and then got involved in a couple of other things, um, as kind of like an entrepreneur and really identified as an entrepreneur during college. But long story short is, uh, built my first e-commerce brand online in college, uh, selling funny vulgar t-shirts. This is before like the POD thing was, was really happening. So I, I printed t-shirts, the local, uh, print shop in, uh, in Bloomington Normal. I went to school at Illinois State and, um, ended up selling that brand and then realizing like, huh, oh, that, that wasn't that hard. Like I found a web, I got a, a logo made. I found some products. I got a website made. You know, I, I ended you up fulfilled yourself. You fulfilled like out of your garage or something. Correct. So it was real easy. I wasn't, I wasn't making it complicated. All black tanks. You could only buy small, medium, large, extra large black tank tops that this was like during the time when like Jim Tan laundry, Jersey shore, people were like, you know, EDM was just coming out, drop the base tanks were like big, you know, like the neon stuff. And, uh, so I, 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 I kept it simple. I didn't have enough money or enough capital to do anything but one standard tank, uh, two or three colors per print. I got them in really small batches. I would get them in, run Facebook ads. Um, you know, if there was one that was like a Jim Tan Laundry Jersey Shore ripoff, I'd be poaching, you know, Snooky, Mike, the situation, si situation, excuse me, and, and, and Jersey Shore in general as like interest because like, the tiny interests were able to be targetable that, uh, back then. And, um, and yeah, I, I would sell through those shirts. I mean, there, again, there wasn't a ton of people doing it. So it was much easier. It was a ton of low hanging fruit. So I ended up, uh, I was self fulfilling all of that. And then I realized like, ah, that was a mess. I don't really want to do that anymore. Um, I, however, I'm, I, I was like, after I sold it, I was like, I could probably do that again. Um, so basically what I did was I ended up starting to, find uh again kind of like earlier days of alibaba when it wasn't as user friendly and not as many sellers as as there are now um i started finding products online like an indestructible iphone charging cord you know at the time you know there was the wide iphone cable and the cable kept getting frayed all the time and i was like it still does yeah they still do and i was like man i bet you like there's a bunch of people who would probably pay me like $45 for like an indestructible iPhone charging cable. Um, so I went on Alibaba, Google translate back and forth a month, two months at a time. Hey, can you, you know, no, I don't want any printing on it. No English words. I just wanted a plane and a white box, you know, get 2000 of them shipped to the United States. Um, and I'll be like, okay, here's, here's the 2000 products I have. Again, spin up a website, uh, get the logo going, and of course, of course, make the social accounts. Um, I'm not big into SEO. A hundred percent of all the e-commerce brands that I've grown have all been using paid traffic. Um, specifically on social media, I've really, really been Facebook heavy. I don't know really much about, uh, um, about the Google advertising platforms or, or really any of the display networks. Um, but I know very deeply about all of the theories, not necessarily all of the technical execution on them. Um, um, which, you know, I, I think that, you know, I've been doing it for, for quite a long time now. And I believe I'm better with the theories or the psychology behind products, which is kind of the things that you and I were nerding out about. But, um, let me summarize it this way. Started, uh, in college, my sophomore, junior year, got the brand up, sold it my senior year, ended up starting a, getting involved with a, a residential exterior painting company, um, uh, kind of owning, uh, owning a branch, um, for a college works painting did really well there. Um, you know, and, and decided, Hey, I want to get back in e-commerce. Um, so over the course of like about five, uh, four years, um, I, I built, uh, nine more e-commerce brands and sold eight of them. 
Um, again, none of them, none of them really big. Um, you know, I would get them to traction and make them a saleable asset and put them on uh, a platform like a Flippa or kind of find some private buyer ch- just through networking. Eventually, what ended up happening was I started kind of getting invited to different meetings for helping other e-commerce brands, to, um, you know, market online and, and, and really run social media ads and build funnels. So I, 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 before like the word like funnel or, you know, customer acquisition model was like really it at least to my attention um existed um i i realized that okay if i buy if i test these 15 audiences i can find one or two products that win um and then just dump money into here and sell them and then i have enough cash flow to go then and test these other you know, these other audiences to sell these other products if I had other stuff. And so, and then I would be like, okay, I got like, you know, I got all this traffic, this page, where is it falling off? So I'd look really closely at Google analytics. How can I improve the copy? Do I need a video? Am I not explaining something properly? What, what information do I need to, to give a a potential customer of mine in order to get them to purchase? So I started really nerding out about um, getting consistency between the product the audience, the copy speaking directly to that audience. Uh, so I'd find really niche audiences. Um, and then having consistency between the, the product, the copy, the creative on the ad, and then the landing page and then the information that was there. Um, and so I started really nerding out about that stuff and I guess kind of became like a, you know, conversion rate optimization nerd. You know, I'll, I'll, for a long time, people would, you know, invite me to conversations, you know, to help a lot of brands in a consulting uh, fashion. They'd be like, oh, you know, this is kind of he's a growth hacker. I, I, you know, came to hate that term. Um, but really, I just I got pretty good at all the uh, customer acquisition. Um, and after I got done with all of that, I decided uh, to kind of just start helping brands. Uh, so I you know, became I was kind of like a lowly level uh hourly consultant. If you paid me a hundred bucks an hour, I'd get on the phone with you. I'd work through projects. I'd think through things. I'd bring out of the box ideas. I'd tell you about my theories, how to implement things with a scrappy, resourceful mentality. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people enjoyed, um, about me. And then, uh, met my business partner at, a at, a a, a collision conference at the like speakers, uh, after party. Um, and you know, uh, kind of the rest is history. We started booming and, and now we're here. Amazing. And now you're working with sort of entertainment brands, people with sort of established distribution networks as well. And you're sort of helping them hone in on their customer acquisition strategies, essentially. Like, and a lot of, I imagine a lot of the brands have like, they have their presence, they have their, their sort of their social presence, their TV presence or whatever, their athletic presence. And then this is sort of helping them monetize that uh, in specific ways. Yeah. So basically what, what we do now and, and what we're best at is we're, we're best at, um, building strategy. And what I mean by that is, um, developing the customer acquisition model, um, from everything from, um, positioning of the brand to positioning of the product to, uh, lots of advertising on the platforms we're advertising and then specifically how, um, we manage everything. So we're a full service. Uh, we're, we're a full service agency. We do everything in house. As you can see, I cleared out my office so we could get some alone time in here. Um, and, and, um, basically, um, we handle everything from, uh, the strategy down through execution and reporting. Very cool. I got it. Are, are you allowed to tell me what LMFDT means? Uh, yeah. So we, I've got a coach. I work with a coach now and, uh, he texted me one day. We, we started saying LFG, let's fucking go. Nice. And, uh, then he texted me one morning and said, hashtag LMFDTS. And it stands for hashtag let's motherfucking do this shit. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he texted me, I printed it on a banner and, and hung it in the office. It's just kind of like a, you get up to go to the bathroom. It's like, all right, come on, let's go. Let's fucking do this shit. I like it. It's a, it, it's definitely a, it sounds like a really booming attitude. So I think, I think it fits. That's, I wanted to ask you quickly. I didn't have this on my list here, but you're, you talked about those early days of getting an asset ready to be saleable. Uh, and I think that's something that's uh, sort of an underlooked part. It's not something that I, that I think a, maybe a lot of people always think about, but like, what are the key things you need 
uh, is it, you know, to, to make an asset saleable like that? Is it really just sort of that, that alignment that you spoke of that you really just want to make sure that everything's on point to the level where you can keep plugging away at a, at a certain audience set and have ads continually be profitable? Is that, is that the, like, what are the main assets you need when, when you're looking at selling a, an e-commerce brand? Great question. This is probably something I can actually provide value. And I feel like I was blowing a lot of air earlier, kind of giving my background. This is something I see all the time. Um, people in a lot of the e-commerce and, you know, Facebook ad buyer groups and Facebook ad hacks and so on and so forth are always trying to sell brands. Think about it this way. An e-commerce company, when you're trying to sell it, is simply an investment. It's an asset, right? People want to be able to know that they're investing their money in something that is eventually going to give them a, a profitable return. Um, so when you're, when you're preparing an e-commerce brand, small or large, I mean, I'm talking like you can, you can take an e-commerce brand that's done 10, 15, $20,000 over, over two, three months, which is relatively low in revenue and, and position it as an asset for purchase. Um, so you, you, you want to make sure that, of course, you have all of your, your basic level assets, like your website, your social media pages, uh, of course, your domain. Um, if you're using a merchant account, most of the time people are using Shopify right now, but you bundle everything together as like, this is what you're buying. You're buying my MailChimp account. You're buying all of these assets. Um, but the other thing that people want to buy is ease of use. And this is where I actually see a lot of um, you know, people who are who start e-commerce brands, whether it be drop shipping um, or, or you know something where they're self-fulfilling, is they're not positioning the investment. People don't want to work very hard once they buy that. They want to buy a starter company, which is why they're buying it from you because they're not very good at, at starting it. You did a lot of the hardest work. They want to buy something where they're like, okay, explain to me how I'm getting this traffic. Explain to me like how this funnel works. And so what I actually do is I bundle together all the assets of like a purchase list of what you're buying. And then basically here's how you'll do it. And I actually create an infographic or a funnel. I mean, you'll see them all over my office. Um, is I'm a very visual person. So like, where, where are people's eyes going? Where are the, where do the buttons lead? Um, but most of the time you'll actually see funnels up on the wall. We've got these big sticky notes. I use them all the time, but to get back to it, a list of what they're buying and a list of essentially how to continue the success and then visualize what, what the current funnel looks like for the, for the buyer. So you're running Facebook ads right? They're going to the website. One of three things is happening. Number one, they make a purchase. That's great. Number two, they abandon their cart. They end up in a funnel. That's where about 60% of our sales are coming from right now, right? Let's just say if we're, if we're running it. Number three, they're being retargeted with this Facebook pixel, right? Or with a retargeting pixel, let's say. In which case I'm retargeting with that. One of them is a major conversion, a purchase conversion. The other two are what I consider to be like a micro conversion, right? They're falling in some, in some sort of funnel. Now I'm staying in front of all these people that ended up clicking on my ad, viewing the product, adding the cart, whatever it is. Some people are getting emails. Some people are getting this. That way the buyer can actually visualize exactly what they're investing in. They're investing in a system. They're investing in audiences that work, products that are proven, a website that converts, and it's, it's, it's a machine visualize the machine for them. Don't just give them what they're buying and start, you know, spewing numbers, you know, numbers can be faked. I, there's probably, probably a lot of people on this, on um, uh, listening to this, um, and, and me and you who could run through a bunch of fake sales through, through, through an e-commerce store. Um, and so you want to make sure you have proven financials, the Google analytics to back it up, um, screen record. So I record um, everything movable, make sure you refresh the pages. Everyone kind of knows those tricks of, of you know, of, of tweaking pages and such. Um, make, you know, give a good compelling case as to why it's a good investment with what you're buying, how you're doing it, a visual representation of how it's happening, and then make sure you have all of the evidence uh, ready because due diligence is coming if it, if it is a proper buyer. That visual aspect of, of, of making people understand the, the, you know, how you don't have leaky funnels, essentially understanding how like there's a place for everyone and a message for everyone and a, and a plan of action to turn them into a sale. That seems like a step that a lot of people would overlook, but I could see as a buyer, that's the exact kind of thing you'd need to, to make something like really tangible, make an asset much more tangible in your mind. Well, again, most of the buyers who are buying an, an already established e-commerce brand 
are doing so because they they don't know how to get from you know steps one through five. They want to start at five. They want something that's proven and established, and they want to kind of grow it and scale it. That that's kind of the difference between like a founder who has the itch to actually create shit and someone who actually wants to be like a business owner, right? Um, so so that that that's kind of the difference. So they don't really if if they had the knowledge to do it themselves, they wouldn't be paying you you know, three, four, five times profit or, you know, two, three times revenue for that brand, depending on what it is and what the assets are, are you know, uh, in, in, are in value, right? They wouldn't be doing that. They just go and do what you're already doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you could really got to break it down um, and, and make it visual for them so they understand. So you have, again, if you can create value, your website, it's just like, I like to say this all the time. People are like, oh, I have this domain, you know, diamond.com i'm like okay that val- that domain's only worth what someone's willing to pay for it right what is the value like okay someone would have to own you know a diamond company or something in order in order to find value in that okay exactly. i want to really create value around this machine this money making machine this investment this company this online customer acquisition model that i've created these products that i've proven out here's all of the assets on and this is an investment vehicle here you are here, here's how I do it. Um, and, and that, that's when really people, when people find a lot of value and when they feel okay, you shouldn't get haggled in price. If, if, some, if people are haggling you in, in price, you know, to, to buy your e-commerce plan, you didn't explain well enough how, how, how to make money with it. You didn't provide them enough value. That makes sense. Very cool. So I want to back up a minute here. I want to, I, w- I would like to get Colin McGuire's advice and I want to start doing this sort of with all my guests as well. What, what would be your, your advice to someone? Okay. So t- take an, an avatar of someone who's maybe tried uh, a drop shipping store. Maybe they've done a little, they've done a little overload flipping. They tried to find some products. Maybe they had a few successful things, but they weren't able to sustain it. Like t- to either that person or, or a newbie person who maybe even hasn't done that yet. What do you see as the biggest opportunity now within e-commerce for people, you know, on the new side of things? What would you advise to them? So are, are you asking like, now that a lot of the low quality, high volume, low margin drop shippers are available, are, are kind of t- had t- have taken over the game, or um, just for people, just for people wanting to get into it, like, do you still like? Is it still? Th- this kind of gets at a question, like about about like people's journeys, you know, how to move from uh, you know drop shipping businesses through to more sustainable brand businesses, basically. But does does that step still involve? like getting your feet wet with, with drop shipping with AliExpress just to really understand the model, to get a few sales, to, to build your ad sets, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to get involved in e-commerce, I, I work with there on Saturday, I'll have two or three uh, groups of people. I kind of have like an e-commerce mastermind here in this office or, or in, you know, in, in the conference room uh, where I'll, I'll, it's kind of like a, like an e-commerce support group uh, where a lot of people are getting started. And yes, to answer your question, um, it is absolutely still, it's not saturated. People are saying, oh, it's so saturated. Well, that's because you're doing it wrong. Um, number the, unless you have a significant amount of capital to put up, um, there is still a really scrappy way to do it and, and to do it right. Um, here's what I recommend. Um, don't start, uh, I mean, you could start a niche store, but I, I really like to start some of like in between like a niche to a general store, maybe like a, for instance, like a kitchen products or like kitchen and home goods, um, where you can actually find overseas, um, manufacturers of, of products. And we'll get into this. I know, but products that have direct response power that, that, that pass the acid test of being sellable in a direct response atmosphere because that's totally different. A great product and a great direct response product are, are, not even in the same league. It's, it's, it's apples to oranges. They're not the same fruit. And so the best way to do it is to still actually drop ship while you're testing products. And so, um, here's kind of my, my approach to anyone who wants to get started in e-commerce. Um, my, my form, my current formula uh, that I would recommend is to start a, first of all, focus on your brand. You have to spend time on it. Pick a name with purpose. Pick a name with purpose that also follows a direct response um, uh, formula, right? Um, and then 
make sure that your brand resonates with the audience that, you, that you're going to be selling to and that also align with the products that are going to be on your store. Don't just give me a text-based logo. Um, you know, don't just use the, the free version of Shopify, you know, spend the $90 and, and get one of the premium templates and spend time. If you're not a designer, find one on Upwork and Freelance. You want to front load your branding and make your website easy to use. You know, the people want to trust it when, when they land on it and to spend some time in your brand. Make sure you get the, the exact Facebook domain, the exact Instagram handle, make sure all that stuff is available, um, get a nice logo made. And then what happens is, so here's what you do. You, you, you find five products that, that you think are, are your winning products because they, they follow a direct response from you on AliExpress or order the five. I don't know if they're overseas or whatever. Okay. If they're overseas here, here's my advice there. If they're overseas, when you, when you're contacting the person before you purchase on AliExpress, message the seller. Say, Hey, I want boxes with no lettering on them. I want plain white boxes. It'll really help you out because you're either going to get it with broken English on the box or a brand that you actually, that it actually isn't your brand. Um, and, and I'll tell you about that in a second, or you're going to get, uh, foreign lettering on the box. Big no, no. Um, and so order the five products and, and make sure you've done your research. I'm kind of skipping. I'm skipping through the research because I know we're going to get there in a minute. But order the five products. When the products come in, take nice photography. Craigslist. You'd be, you'd be surprised how many, how many cheap broke free, photographers, broke photographers <laughs> are, on, are on Craigslist. Or if you post on Facebook, hey, do you have a friend that's a photographer locally? Like, they want to, they're taking pictures for fun most of the time and, and want to take more pictures for money. And, and to be honest with you, I've lowballed a ton of them in it and it works out. Also, if you have an iPhone 7 Plus, if you have an iPhone 7, 6 Plus, 7 Plus, 8 Plus with that, with that newer camera on it, it shoots 4K video. And if you get the correct lighting, you can actually take pretty nice photos, um, on your iPhone. But anyways, Take photos of the packaging. Remember, the reason why you want that no lettering and no foreign lettering on it, you want the, the, the box to be plain. I often request a plain white box if possible on what I'm ordering, um, but it should be the actual packaging that it would ideally come in. You're going to ask them, you're going to tell them, this is the formula when I message them, hey, I'm looking to make bulk orders of this product. However, this is a test run. Is it possible if I order three, is it possible for you to give me packaging that has no lettering on it. If they say no, then move on to the next one. There's usually a second seller for that. Find that seller that is willing to give you that product with no lettering on the packaging. When it gets there, take photos of the packaging. When it's white, you can go on Upwork and have really anyone who's decent at Photoshop put your logo on the packaging. Now it looks like a branded product you own. I know that's not the cheapest way to go about it, but now you have great quality photography of the of the box that it comes in. Then take it out of the box. Of course, take photography of that, um, and then create a five second video. Um, what you can do here is, if it, let's say it's you know I've I've seen the spatulas all like the scooping spatulas yeah. and the skating spatulas and all of those. Those are all over in the in the direct response world. Um, make your own video, right? Set like make a five. Put some sausages in a pan, get it, get, get, get something going and, and make a five second clip. If you, and again, you can go on Upwork and you can find a great video editor to put a text overlay on it, to edit the video, to get a five second video that shows the value or the product in use. So people know right away what that is, turn it into a GIF, a high quality GIF, put it on the product page. Now you have the video for ads for your direct response ads on yep. Facebook and such. You have the GIF on the product page. You also have a video that you're able to embed on the product page. But now what you have is you have a product that's in China. You have it here. You have quality branded photography, great video uh, for not only your website, uh, but also for direct response ads. Now get all five of those products up for sale on your website. Um, take all of those videos. And again, I keep on skipping over this, but there's a certain formula to a video that you want to follow. Start running your ads. When you get orders, this is what happens. You know they're being dropped. You're potentially using Oberlo or whatever the other uh, competitors are. Dropified, yeah, yeah, dro dropified. This is this this is the this is something again. Lazy people are are doing wrong. If you really want to do well long term, this is what you do. F again, five products. 
Don't get, don't go product crazy. Test a bunch of audiences. When you're getting your first initial sales on those products, pick up the phone and call these people. It's usually, you know, some lady named Karen from Missouri who ordered your spatula product. Call her. Say, hey, my name's, you know, my name's Colin McGuire. I own XYZ company. I saw your order come through. First of all, I wanted to thank you for your order. Second of all, I'm currently out of stock on that product, but um, a lot of, and, and I, I just sold out. I just ordered more for my manufacturer. Um, so it's going it, to, it might, it might be a little while. Um, a lot of people have been finding me on Facebook recently and that product sold out really quick. They're going to say this. Oh yeah, I found you on Facebook too. Yeah, no shit. Because that's the only way, only way I'm getting traffic to this website and this product. And you say, I'm, I may have my manufacturer ship the product to you directly. I will let you know soon. And now she had connected with the business owner from something she purchased online. They called her. They thanked her for their order. She now has the expectation set that this thing is not coming very quickly. You have two to four weeks now to get that product from China in white packaging to her doorstep. So now, once you've found three products that are winning, now's when you knock up and you order 50, 60, 70, 80 of them in that white packaging from, from overseas. Get them here, put them in your bedroom. I've seen people order 500, 600, 1,000 at a time for a few products when, when they follow this formula. Get a, get a $45 a month storage unit locally. I live in Chicago, so they're, they're all over the place downtown. And guess what? They have a, most of them have Wi Fi. They have an outlet for your label printer. You can even go and fulfill your boxes there. But, anyways, get them here. Your winning products. Now keep running those ads. And when they get here, you can stop picking up the phone and calling Karen. And you can just start shipping them out. Now they're your products. You own them here in the States. Um, and so, and again, if products do die quickly, so you got to make sure that you, you're not ordering too much. Don't, don't give yourself cash flow issues. But that's my formula of like, if you want to survive in this world, be scrappy, get the products from overseas, shoot the correct photography, the correct creative you need, give, set yourself up for success. So you're not getting charged back from the people that are ordering your stuff. You're not getting horrible reviews. And I, I guarantee you, when you have another winning product and you email that lady, Karen, she's going to open up the email and she's going to be like, oh, I remember when the owner of this company called me about my spatula tongs. Yep. He told me they were going to be, you know, two to four weeks and they came here in two to four weeks. And nice. oh, the packaging came in an e-packet. That's weird. Oh, never mind. He did mention that it was going to come directly from his manufacturer. Now there's no red flags. Now you, you, you can you can hit that customer up again for another sale with more products. And now you have the products here in the States and you don't have to worry about drop shipping. You can sell hundred to 200 products a day and it'll take you two, three hours a night to package them all up, print out the shipping labels, drop them off at your USPS, FedEx or UPS store. And then when you get a really strong product, then you can invest in a fulfillment center. Then you can basically like once, once you know you found a niche or you've got something that, oh. that, uh, that you, that you can go a bit more on, you can, you could, you could upgrade to, to that fulfillment center. But I imagine, yeah, you'd have to make sure you found a good niche. You'd have to make sure that the product wasn't going to burn out essentially, which I guess is a, is a common issue as well. Yeah. I mean, the issue with product burnout, in my opinion, is that these, these drop shippers end up getting such bad reviews. Um, you know, they bad reviews, their website isn't branded. They don't have, they're reusing the same photography and videography that everyone else is using, which is um, a huge red flag for Facebook now, right? Like they're coming after that hard. Correct. 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 And I just think that I, I have a sense that what ends up happening is they see a decline in the product sales. And instead of actually being invested and using that creative and finding new audiences and new, you know, creative refresh because you're limited to what you stole from someone else that you're just like, ah, screw it. I'm giving up. I'm going to another product. I don't think that that's actually a burnout of the product. I've seen products get revived all the time with creative refresh, repositioning, 
you know, you have the products here in the state, you can actually shoot new videos and new photos of them. You can, you know, hit up your Facebook friend and say, hey, can I borrow your kitchen for 30 minutes so I can shoot this video? You can be really scrappy about it. You can also start getting really advanced as you start making some good money. Hire a videographer, hire a photographer, get, you know, get some really nice lifestyle photos um, created. There, it's, it's, it's not as difficult as people think. And I don't think the products are burning out. I think people are giving up on them too quickly. And the brands or the stores that are selling them are too low quality that it's, it's kind of like a, it, it's a compound effect between the two. They're cutting corners, right? And like, even when you, when you talking about the packaging, it's like, that's just, that's a continuation of, of what you, what you built your business on, which is a continuity of an experience, right? Like you, the phone call through to the packaging, it's sort of like, it just creates a, a, a more seamless customer experience. And when you have breaks along that chain, you're, you're gonna, it's, it's not going to work in the long term. Yep. Um, one of my friends, Dan Alaric is the CEO of Grunt Style. Um, I feel like a lot of people know him in the space. I was actually touring his, we're in the same entrepreneur group. I, he invited me out to, uh, his facility and I was like, what are all these people doing? And he's like, oh, those are the people that call you and thank you for your order when you make one. And I was like, what? I don't know if he still, I don't know if they still do that or not, but basically like, that's when I got the idea. I was like, when I'm launching and testing products, chargebacks suck, nasty emails suck, bad Facebook reviews suck, bad Yelp reviews suck. Like I don't want nasty comments on my stuff. And so call, make a personal connection with that, with, with that person. It takes two minutes of your time and that lady will never bother you again. And she'll buy from you for years to come. If you can always put good products in her email or in front of her on her Facebook feed or wherever. And I, I want to get, I want to get more into branding and this idea of LTV. And I think it's something that, that, that a lot of marketers overlook. There's just a lot of churning of customers going on. And Ben Malal just made a great post today about, uh, you know, if you're not focused on the LTV of, of, of your customers, you know, you're not going to be in this game for, for in the, within the next two or three years, basically. But I want to go back and talk about the, I want to talk about direct response brand. So to give the viewers a, a bit of a background on this, like, I'm looking at, at a couple of PO, I'm, I'm interested in the POD space right now. I think it's a really cool opportunity. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of toying around with, with, with some, some projects and I've got some, some artist friends that I'm interested in working with. And I sort of showed Colin one of the artists that I was, that I was interested in working with. And I, and my, my concern was, you know, this artist is, he's got these beautiful abstract paintings. He's got these things that I, like digital paintings that I would love to hang on my wall that, uh, that, that I think would be great. They, they, they really speak to me basically. And Colin cautioned me against, uh, the difference between a good product and a good direct response product, because the, the canvas stores that I see working really well are the ones that are all about value signaling, right? They're the ones that are all about like hustle till you die or, you know, like I love golden retrievers or whatever. It was really things that people can latch on to. So talk a little bit about the difference between a good product and a good direct response product. And, and then talk also about how you do, how, how creative plays into that as well. Cause you alluded to that. Yep. So I've got a little sticky note here with, when you start playing with a, a few of like the larger brands, you of course have like NDAs, not non-disclosures. And so I have a, I have a short list of brands that I can actually give examples that I got approval to talk, uh, to talk about. So, mm -hmm. um, but one of them is actually, um, we just launched, uh, Torque Energy by the Diesel Brothers. So one of the number nice. one shows on the Discovery Channel. I know Van, that, yeah. Van Oaks was on. Yeah. Yep. And I've been on a couple of emails with him. I don't know him personally. He's working on like the diesel power gear side of things or actually launching a brand from the ground up, which was their energy drink. They also sell it on diesel power gear. Um, but um, building this, it, it's an energy drink. Okay. The way that you sell an energy drink, I'm going to give an example. I'm going to dive back into your POD okay. because this was the best way I, I think I can describe it um, is – the way you sell an, the way you sell something brick and mortar or not online, not in a, in a non direct response atmosphere is totally different than the, than the way you sell or the reason why people buy stuff online. You take a torque energy drink. It's an energy drink. You're selling an energy drink brick and mortar. When you're selling it on, online, you're selling all day sustained energy. And, fo and improve focus without the crash. Okay. Okay. You're, it's not an energy drink. It's it's an outcome. It's people the outcome. With emotions, people buy with emotions. They have to feel attached to something. They have to they buy with emotion and justify with logic later. So my theory on this is, 
you sell an energy drink brick and mortar and you sell all day sustained energy and focus with no crash with torque energy. Here's the re here's now people are like, Oh, that's what I'm interested. I feel unfocused at work and tired most days, like most people do. Right. Um, so now they're interested in my app. They see the diesel brothers. They see the can, they see the message, right? They click on it. Now they're on my product page. Now they want to know how, is this going to give me all day sustained energy and an improved focus without the crash from an energy drink? Why is it different than Rebel? Why is it different than Monster? Um, this is on the product display page when you win that argument. The reason why Torque is different is because it has t in it. t is some patented um, all natural herbal ingredient that's added. It extends the half-life of caffeine, reduces the jitters, um, and, and basically because it extends the half-life of caffeine, it, it removes that horrible crash. Of course, there is some sort of crash. It's not like, you know, I'm not giving medical terms here, but this is the way you sell it. Oh, the product feature is it has t in it, which does this. Every single time you mention a feature of your product, there should be an automatic benefit or outcome to it. Again, people are only buying with, with emotion and justifying with logic. So now let's go back to your, your, your the, the art that you showed me. That artist is very talented. Beautiful. Um, I bought, you know, abstract art. It, I don't really know the, the proper technical term for it, but it was more or less kind of like abstract art that you'd be printing on canvas. Yeah. It's art. It's great. It's definitely worth 150 to $250, which is, I believe what you want to sell it for. Right. It lacks, it severely lacks direct response power. It doesn't, you can't give anything that's relatable to this painting. It, it's beautiful. So people scroll through their feed, they see, like, get all day sustained energy, improved focus without the crash, and they see an energy drink, they see a painting, it's buy this beautiful painting. I see a lot of fucking beautiful paintings. Yeah. There's no However, why. There's no why, right? Like with Apple, Apple's all about, you know, you lead with the why. And so, you know, you, you need a two inch drill hole. You don't need a two inch drill bit, you know? And so, so that's really what, what you're saying as well there that like you need to, you need to lead with the why, answer the why first. And with abstract art, there just isn't a why. It sort of defies that in a way, right? So you're, you might, you might get the odd person, one out of a thousand people like me that that speaks to on this level. And they say, that's what I'm looking for. I've seen a lot of other crap out there, but that's not mass direct response marketing. That's, that's super niche. Yeah, that's not a calculated investment on your ads. Think about your ads as an investment, yeah. right? There's not enough. You're, you can't make a calculated assumption that people are going to buy with emotion just because it's beautiful. However, you can, if you take that abstract art and you put a message about um, working with your hands, right? like getting your hands dirty or something. I don't, I don't know. It could yeah. be any. Forget the example I gave you in the Facebook messages, but... You need to, there's nothing that people can attach to emotionally. Basically what it is, is the audience, the product and the call to action or the benefit is not there. There's no consistency between the three. You go back to uh, Karen from Missouri who bought the scoop tongs. She wants to save time and, and, you know, make things easier in the kitchen. Okay. We can target her because she's a homeowner. Um, she often buy things, often buys things online and she's into cooking. She's into all these cooking pads, all these cooking interests. We put the spatula in front of her. We can show her the value. It's, I can scoop up 10 sausage at a time. I can scoop up all these eggs. I can use them as tongs. I can use it as a spatula. I can do all these things. And in five seconds, I can communicate the value of the spatula. Exactly. To her. In five seconds, she can emotionally relate to it. She can see the outcome that it's going to, the benefit it's going to have in her life. And she's going to click onto the page and now learn more about that product. The outcome isn't there with the beautiful abstract painting, unless you can somehow relate it to that person or that audience that you're giving it to. Um, and to kind of go back to Torque, the great thing about it is as long as one of their famous faces are holding the can, it will stop them in the newsfeed enough to read my message, which is this is all day sustained energy and focus without the crash. Right. Yeah. And then, and now they, they don't, they learn how and why and what it tastes like. And they're like, oh, wow, no, no one orders energy drink. No one. If you want an energy drink, you go to Walgreens or your course or a gas station. You're not buying them online. They're a bitch to ship. And, you know, but it's working, right? It's, it's because it's a great product and we have a great direct, we have good direct response juice 
And I don't know if you want me to get into kind of my personal acid tests on whether or not the product has direct response power or even the service has direct response power. But let's do it. Let's let's get to some acid testing. I think, I, you know, when you talk about seeing the project product in use, I think to all of all the infomercials you've seen where it not only shows the product working, it shows someone else's experience with the previous product that they had in their life, like their boring one dimensional spatula that they tried to pick up sausages with and all the sausages fell off their spatula. You know, like that, that sort of trope with, uh, with infomercials about how, you know, Oh, have you ever yeah. tried to use a toaster this way? Oh, it's the worst. There's, there's a reason why infomercials haven't died. Yeah. That's why, because they're showing the awkward pain. It's either you're either saving time, saving money or improving your life somehow. And they really sell you on that emotion. They sell you, sell you, sell you on the emotion. Give you a feature, show you a benefit. Give you a feature, show you a benefit. You can use it anywhere, like on this brick if you have stains, right? Like they're, they're, they're leading with their uh, feature, but they're giving a benefit. And so um, I, have an ad, I have a few different acid tests for it. I even have acid tests for naming your, naming your e-commerce brand. So, um, you know, does your e-commerce brand – communicate enough of an outcome to a relatable audience. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's, um, you know, use torque energy, okay. gear heads, gear heads, people are in the trucks, you know, working with their hands, um, you know, um, maybe, um, you know, extreme bow, bow, bow hunters. Uh, yeah. Extreme outdoor <laughs> torque energy. Yeah. Boom. Like that, that's a word that, those people respond to an energy that explains what the product is. Um, I'm, you know, I'll give a little leak here. Like I'm working on something where it's like best life goods. What is that? Well, we sell, we sell products that made, that make your life better. It's, it's pretty. And, and the logo responds to, to that, the, to the type of consumer we're, we're going after. Okay. And, and so that's an acid test for a company name is, does it relate? Does it show value somehow? Does your name, don't just name it, you know, you know, uh, one Oh vacuums, one Oh one or something like I, I need to be able to somehow relate to the audience. So that's an acid test for that. But on the direct response side of things with products and videos and such is if, if your product or service cannot communicate the benefit or the outcome or the value in five seconds or less in a video, you don't have you don't have a product that's direct response uh, that that's going to thrive in a direct response mar marketing funnel. Let's go back to your painting. In five seconds, could you explain to someone with only that painting? And and five seconds, could you explain how it's going to bring value to their life? Yeah, it's it. I can't really. And I, I've been thinking about it, and it's like uh, it, I'm also wondering: is there an acid test? Like you you mentioned when you you're selling a product and you're going to call someone, they're probably going to be in Nebraska in the heartland somewhere. It's going to be a woman named Karen or something like that. Is that an acid test? Like, do you really need to like? Can you build products for uh, erudite hipsters in in metropolis cities? You know what I mean? Like, can you like sh should you be should one of your assets be uh, your acid test be? Will people in Middle America buy this? Because it's like you know. I, I hear people even talking about running e-commerce campaigns and like blocking California, A, because it's more expensive and B, just because it, they don't find they have the right type of audience there. Like, do you need to focus on products that have this sort of mass appeal or is there still room to come in and try to reach people with, you know, like I, if you, I, I think about it, there must be, right? Because you look at the fifth watches or movement watches or whatever, like these have these sort of have these like, you know, New York, San Francisco vibes to them. But I'm wondering your thoughts on like when you're actually picking your niche, is it important to focus more on the middle than the, than on the fringe? I don't think location, the niche doesn't matter. The only thing that does matter is the five is seconds. It, well, no, it, when you're talking about the audience, it's it, there's an acid test for the audience. Uh, so there's not a test. If your product is even a service. Okay. If you have a legal service, let's say I'm a lawyer and I want to run a Facebook ad. Actually, I think that's illegal. I don't think you can promote yourself. Let's, let's talk. Um, I'm a dentist. If you want to do great in direct response ads and generate leads for a dentist, don't just run a general dental video. In five seconds, show the value of coming to that dentist. Whiten teeth, straighten teeth, fix teeth, right? Show the value. TV's on the ceiling. Love that. Yeah. Show the value. <laughs> the outcome of what's going to happen or with, or with, you know, torque energy, 
you know, it is, you can show the value of like, actually torque energy is a bad example. Um, let's see here. Um, we got a brand stick it that we work with. It's a wine accessory. It takes the, the sulfite additives out of wine that some people are allergic to, but most people get like worsened effects from drinking wine. I don't know. I'm not, I, I'm actually allergic to sulfites. So I don't drink wine, which is funny why they're a client of ours. But <laughs> if you can show stirring this little drink stir in your glass of wine for three seconds and now the salt and like put text on the video, sulfites are gone. That's not actually showing the product working. But you can communicate in five seconds. You stir it in a glass of wine. Now the sulfite additives in your wine are gone, and you're not going to experience those side effects, right? That is a great direct response video. That is a direct response product. You can win in a direct response atmosphere if you can communicate in five seconds for it. Um, but anyways, going into the audience is, is the audience targetable enough online? Do do Are they available? So to your... I think you said like hipsters in Seattle. Sure. Okay. So you now are, you're, you're, you have to target the state of Seattle or, or, you know, Seattle, Washington, the city, right? Greater Seattle area, direct marketing area around there. Um, and now you have to start finding interests. Well, as soon as I have to start guessing interests and hipster isn't targetable, you probably aren't off to a great start. As soon as you have to start guessing what people are into, right? You're probably like, eh, I'm, this isn't good. With the wine, people who drink wine. It's a big audience. With, with you know, if you're going to sell print on demand, you know, uh, stuff for gearheads, like you're going to target people who are into, you know, diesel trucks, motorcycles, whatever it is, like gearhead interest. There's direct gearhead interest. Yeah. There's not necessarily like direct hipster interest. So if you cannot, the, if, if the acid test is, if you cannot directly target with like a straightforward, targeting, uh, then it's probably not something you want to get started with. Is it something you can grow into? Absolutely. Is it impossible to start with it? No. Will it take more money and a lot more testing? Yes, it will for sure. Facebook needs a targeting option to target things for when before they were cool. And then you could target hipsters, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they have that uh, preemptive uh, time travel targeting yet, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I'm going to continue. I, I, I there's, I, 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 there's something I'm going to work on my five second pitch. I'm going to come back at you with it when we do another podcast. I've, I've got a few other ideas I'm going to uh, run by you, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to sort of move on there. I, I really liked your formula for, uh, for being scrappy and getting into, getting into, uh, you know, e-commerce through, you know, ordering products and, and just, and I just did this the other day with something else. I have, I have, I have this other little thing that I'm kind of thinking about. And I just ha sent that email to an AliExpress guy saying, I want to order in bulk, but first I need to have a small order up front. And they were totally, they were totally into it that, you know, I could okay. do an order of just 10 things and, uh, oh awesome. it was no problem. Right. So I, I think, I think you're dealing, you know, you're dealing with reasonable people. You're dealing with factories that just want more and more business. Right. So as long as you're reasonable, as long as you present yourself in the right way, I think, I think it's quite possible to, to get these people to be flexible. Um, you, you answered my next question, which was like, how important is branding going forward? I think a lot of people neglect the brand. I was just looking at this guy named Chris Conradi, who started up a branding Facebook, uh, uh, e-commerce group. And he's got a lot of sort of like basic stuff about, about why it's important to build a brand. But you, you sort of led with that. And you just said, like, if you're building a store, even if it's a general store, uh, you want to you want to build a brand that kind of makes sense. And that's, so that's something that, that you'd echo as, as like a must for people getting into e-commerce now. Yeah. If. I mean, it's not necessarily a must. Again, like I'm, I'm not a big fan of like never, you know, yeah. I'm like never, or, like this is, you know, it's a must or Always, something. Always, yeah. In my opinion, if you want long term success, if you want to get into that lifetime customer value that we were talking about, you have to build a reliable brand. And in order to do that, you have to have, you have to have not only great product photos, you have to have lifestyle photos. Don't have just a bunch of stock images. Invest the few hundred dollars it costs to it's it's worth it up front to invest in some lifestyle imagery or the product, get photos with it, people holding it, people in a setting they might be using it. If it's a you know, POD stuff, get it on people. Again, iPhones, iPhone GoPros, great for video. iPhones, iPhone pluses, iPhone tens, whatever they are, you know, I don't really know Androids very well. I'm sure there's a few out there that, that do well on that too. Take lifestyle images. You'd be amazed 
what a shitty iPhone photo that you think looks awful. If you send it off to the correct editor, they can, you know, edit it, crop it, you know, do whatever they need. You can create graphics. You can use it as source material for branding. You can hand it off to designers for ads. You can create videos off of static images, which I mean, I think I'm hoping a lot of people are really aware of. But some of the videos that we've been running on Facebook for clients recently, these advertorial style videos that are just like images with animated text and stuff are actually doing much better than these well-produced videos. Um, and you can do these on iMovie. Like you, you mentioned oh. about sending it off to a videographer or whatever, but like spend an hour and play around with iMovie. Like it's, in, it's an incredibly intuitive software and you can do most of that stuff. Uh, yeah. And there's other products like promo and things like that that allow you to turn, uh, you know, static images into, into videos as well. So I think there's so many opportunities. When it comes, I'm, I'm an amateur photographer as well. And when it comes to the quality of an image, like so much of it is dependent on lighting. Right. So much of it is based on whether you're using the, a, a nice lighting situation. It's so, and it's pretty easy yep. once you know some, some basics about lighting to light things properly. And there's also, you can also buy $30 product kits on, on Amazon or whatever to, to build perfect little light boxes that allow you to do everything, um, just as you need to. So and, there's and no excuses. It's not, yeah. And if, and if you are not confident enough or you're not creative enough, like to be honest with you, I, I have never edited a, like I, I, even if I opened up iMovie and honestly, if I probably spent two days with it, I, I don't think I, I could do it. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. But you don't know what I can do. I can explain very specifically what I want and I can go on Upwork and there is people, even the shittiest version of it is better than nothing. And it, it you can go on Upwork, you can go on Fiverr, you can get videos edited, like 30 second videos edited with animated text and stuff for like 50, 60 bucks. I mean, there's people out there that will do it as long as you have the source material that you can give them. Take and the, the vision. Book, take the video and the vision. Know what you want to portray. Again, with that, you know, make sure in five seconds you can communicate what the product is and what the value, I mean, excuse me, not what the product is, but the value, what the, like it in use, what values are going to bring to your life. Put text overlay on it. Tell them that's what you want. And you can get a video back for under a hundred bucks that looks good i mean it's better than most of the shit i see yeah right. so very cool so we're coming up on an hour here but i i you mentioned one other thing that i really want to get your thoughts on it's it's on everyone's mind right now um you know the 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 whistleblower uh chris wiley uh from the um the the, the guardian piece or the alexander the alexander nicks facebook uh issue that's going on right now the guy, Chris Wiley, is actually from Victoria. I, I know the company that, that, that he is now whistleblowing from. Uh, so it's a really sort of interesting situation here. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, Facebook is going crazy cleaning up accounts, which is, which is great. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things. But I wanted to get your thoughts on this. It's, you know, it's so interesting when you, when I was driving to work this morning and on like my local, sh like 95 9, the zone, they're talking about this issue. And it's amazing how broad this is. I think it's amazing how much sort of, general ignorance there is about what Facebook is and what they've done. And I'm, I'm just interested in your, in your stance on, on, on this issue. I mean, if you're not paying for a service, first of all, you are the product. Um, Fact. if it's not funded by the government or you're not paying for it, you are the product and your data is the product. And every single day people trade their, their privacy for convenience and then get mad in my opinion then they get mad when they realize it of course yes there is situations where potentially uh some of the stuff with facebook that's been going on that i've heard is like eh, you know that probably wasn't right is it as detrimental as we're all talking about right now in my opinion probably not again i'm pretty loosey-goosey with my personal information uh, you can find i'm not very hidden on the internet if you want my data, come to me. I'll sell it to you because you don't have to buy it from Facebook. Because, and when I say people trade their their privacy for convenience, people don't want people don't want to give their information away. But at the same time, they want relevant organic content from Facebook from their algorithm, and they also want people to put really cool services that they and products that they didn't know they need in their feed. People say they hate ads; they don't. Um. I, you know, I hate, you know, I don't hate marketing, but like I hate being marketed to, but every once in a while I discover a product or a service. Actually, I discovered iStack training, right? 
through an ad. And I was like, yep. man, this is, uh, you know, something I would want to go on. You guys are doing that Thailand mastermind and Facebook mastermind live and everything. And unfortunately I didn't get the opportunity to go, but I'm willing to trade my privacy 10 out of 10 times. So you guys can target me in an ad for something that I'm actually that interested in. Of course. Yeah. I have to scroll through all the Facebook gurus that are selling me bullshit because I'm, I'm, I'm an internet marketer. And of course that's, that's what's in my data set. But, um, I don't agree. Uh, of, of course, there's a certain amount of things that are being abused. So I have to be careful what I say there, but there was some overstepping for sure. But the thing that's, again, this is sort of the narrative in all news these days. There's no mention of like personal responsibility. There's no mention of like, but Facebook didn't make anyone do anything. You know what I mean? Like there, there's obviously layers of manipulation, but we live in an insanely manipulative society. Like there, yeah. we're being manipulated on all sides all the time by the news, yeah. by this, by that. Like manipulation is just a fact of our, of our lives. And, and if you can't take the personal responsibility to be like, I'm a, I'm a, a human soul that has to make my own decisions, uh, in this world. And, and, and if you just want to put everything off onto these, these, these sort of these other factors, like you're going to be manipulated your whole life. Yeah. I mean, People don't realize where all this data is coming from. When you go to Whole Foods and you swipe your credit card or you go to Target, they're logging information, the products you're into, how much money you're spending, what kind of card you have, and they're selling it to data companies. How do you think you're able to target people on Facebook based on if they're a frequent credit card user or not? Yeah. Exactly. Where, where do you think they get that? How do you think they know the behavior of people who who buy organic food at the grocery store? How do you know the people who are – how do they think they – how do people – how is Facebook making the targetable behavior of higher than average spenders at grocery stores? Your data is being sold everywhere. You are constantly trading your privacy for convenience. And then when people find out about it, they get angry. And of course, yes, you can pay with cash. You can do things to your point, but it, you know, I forget exactly where I was going with it, but your data is being sold everywhere. Facebook isn't the only place that your data is being mined. It's everywhere. It's all the apps on your phone. It's, you know, yeah. it's Amazon, it's Alexa, it's Facebook, it's every website that uses Google AdSense. I mean, it is your data is being collected everywhere. Yes, there was, you know, I think the, the biggest situation that I've heard that is, you know, seems to be most talked about is like how the company was using quizzes where you log in with your Facebook, they would ask you questions where they could kind of screen you for your political views. And then they would mix it with data that you could get from any custom audience. If <laughs> any marketer here could upload an email list now, with you know, sort them by political, create custom audiences, create lookalike audiences and advertise to. In my opinion, fuck that scrappy. I wish I would have thought I know. I really wish I would have thought of that's ingenious. That is great marketing. Is it invasive as shit? Yes, it is. Um, and again, everyone, people are on different sides. I'm also a marketer, but like screening people with a quiz you log in on Facebook, getting their Facebook information, creating lookalike audiences, organized based on what you think their potential political views are, and then creating lookalike audiences and advertising those people, like that is genius. Yes, is it highly invasive? Yes, did they probably not tell people that they were doing it? Yeah, but like, it that's that's crazy intricate. Um, yeah. And I bet you that's happening. And uh, so this, this this is what I'll say. And um, is it wrong? Probably to some people. Am I almost like proud that like something that intricate was pulled off like from and from like a digital marketing standpoint when most people can't figure out or run a profitable ad? Yes, I'm impressed. Is it wrong? Yes. Are other people doing it? For sure. Oh, yeah. Like, there's so much black hat marketers out there. They're doing way worse than that. Um, but they're going to get clamped down on hard, I think, after this, which, which rightfully so, right? Like, we're yeah. only doing white hat methods. We only teach white hat methods. That's our whole community is white hat marketers. So, yeah. uh, but, but I think black, this will be another strike against the black hat world. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and I think the hits are going to kind of keep on coming. So, it's like, it, it, it's, it is a very interesting playing field. Cause as you say, like data isn't going any, we're only going to go into a more connected world. We're only going to go into a world where there's more and more known. Like I think Uber is going to be predictive within like five years. Like th there'll be an Uber at your door as you go to touch the app, basically. Like I, I think that the amount of data that's being collected all around us, that doesn't mean that we can't, that there shouldn't be 
uh, you know, like, um, you know, measures taken to shore up data security and there needs to be the, these oh, points. Yeah. But, but, at the, you know, it's, it's funny that, that Facebook is, is, is cracking down so hard on so many things when that, that's their business model. That, and it's not going anywhere, right? Like they're only going to continue to mine data one way or the other. Yeah. Again, listen, if you're not paying for the service and even if you are, most of the time you're, you are the product or one of the products. And so, you know, there's a reason why the Amazon Alexa service is free. Exactly. Okay, well, let's leave it there. Uh, it's been a great talk with you today, Colin. And uh, do you think you'll make it out to Barcelona? Um, I'd actually really like to. Um, well, I'll have to ch kind of check in with our team and, and kind of plan that out. I'd like to. I brought it up to my business partner. Um, it, it would be real fun to head out there um, and, and meet up with you guys. Of course, the location is beautiful, but... Um, yeah, I'll have to get back to you. And, and again, I really do appreciate, um, you know, you, you having me on and, and kind of um, me being able to share my views and, and my theories and my strategies and, uh, you know, ha happy to share anything more with, with, with anyone. If anyone's got questions, uh, let you know, let me know. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share value wherever I can. And I really do appreciate you having me on, man. Nice. Yeah, I think you shared a lot. So if people want to get in touch with you, they can check out Boomin, maybe contact through Boomin. Uh, maybe yeah. find you on Facebook. What, what are what are your chosen? I see you're active on uh, on ecom empires as well, and a few other places. I'm sure. Yeah, um, uh, my um, Instagram is at Colin Magoo M C G O O. Um, our company name is Boomin B O O M N dot com. Um, so there's there's no vol in it. Uh, I'm at, I'm on Facebook Facebook dot com. Uh, slash Colin Magoo. My last name is McGuire, but Magoo became my nickname around like college-ish time. And again, that's C-O-L-I-N-M-C-G-O-O. -O. So I'm Colin Magoo on Facebook, slash Colin Magoo on Facebook, slash Colin Magoo on Instagram. Um, yeah, ha happy to connect with anyone that, that has questions and, and uh, talk e-commerce, talk marketing, and, and so on and so forth. Nice. And I'm going to hit you up with my five-second pitch for abstract hipster paintings as soon as I put it together. All right. I'll, I'll give it the acid test. Cheers, brother. Thanks a lot. Man, see ya. Thanks Bye. so much.